Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Sinney, as you probably know by now, most of you, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Penn Museum. Uh, many thanks to all of you for coming to tonight's sold out installment of our annual Greats Lectures. Uh, this year, of course, our theme is the rise of the city to tie in with the opening of our new Middle East galleries in April 2018. And we have selected speakers and topics which will give us sort of a 360 degree look of what makes a city, how they grow, where and why. The next lecture in our series will be on December 6th and will feature our own Dr. Simon Martin, associate curator in the American section who will be talking about the urbanized jungle, ancient Maya garden cities. Yeah, sounds interesting, doesn't it? Simons always do. Aliens, gardens, they're always great. So as usual, after our speaker's presentation, there'll be time for some Q&A. And if you would like to ask a question, I think there'll be a microphone being passed around so you, everybody can hear the question. Um, and so to our speaker. Dr. Joseph Wegner is Associate Professor of Egyptian Archaeology in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. He is also a Associate Curator in the Egyptian section of the Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. He received his BA in 1989 and his PhD in 1996, both from the University of Pennsylvania. So Joe really is one of our own. His dissertation was on the topic of the development of the Osiris cult in Abydos during the Middle Kingdom, and he's a specialist of the archaeology of Egypt's Middle Kingdom. Joe is one of the more active field archaeologists in the museum, conducting regular field seasons at Abydos, sometimes more than one a year. And he has lavished decades of attention on that site in various forms. Uh, in 2014, Abydos rewarded his persistence when he discovered the tomb of a new pharaoh, one Wosanibre Senebkai, who ruled Abydos in the 17th century BCE. Closer to home, Joe is a valued member of the curatorial community here in the museum, and recently co-authored with Jennifer Hauser-Wegner a wonderful book, uh, which would make an excellent holiday gift, um, <laughs> entitled The Sphinx That Traveled to Philadelphia, the story of the colossal sphinx in the Penn Museum. Yeah. In addition, with his colleagues in the Egyptian section, Joe has put a very substantial amount of time and thought into the reinstallation of the Egyptian galleries, the design of which is part of our new fundraising campaign, Building Transformation, which was officially announced today. For some of us, this has been a long and exciting day, um, along with the groundbreaking we had in the Harrison Auditorium. You remember the Harrison Auditorium? We ritually removed some seats. It won't be long before we're back in there. Well, it will, but... Um, so you may, have, you may have seen the Inquirer and Metro pieces about our work. Uh, I think the Metro piece was headlined, Making the Mummies Dance. Um, so keep an eye open for more great press about that. So with all this, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Joe to talk to us tonight on a topic which I first enc encountered as it happens a few months back during one of the Egyptian Galleries meetings. So please join me in welcoming him for his presentation on the lost cities of ancient Egypt, Joe. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Steve, for your kind words of introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see such a full house. Uh, I never realized there was so much interest in the old, moldy cities of ancient Egypt. Um, uh, my goal tonight is to kind of walk you through a very quick look um, at the study of ancient Egyptian uh, urban centers, uh, settlement archaeology. Uh, urban archaeology, as we like to call it, is one of the most vibrant and uh, dynamic areas of research into ancient Egypt. Um, and we're going to delve into a little bit of my personal uh, experience with that uh, topic. Uh, so uh, getting underway here, um, I thought I'd start today with um, a quote from a very famous Egyptologist, um, probably not known to many of you in the room, but a well-known Egyptologist nonetheless. Less. Um, one John Wilson, he was a professor of Egyptology at the Uni University of Chicago. Um, and back in 1961, he authored an article that uh, we do like to make fun of nowadays uh, quite a bit. Um, you see the title there, Egypt Through the New Kingdom, Civilization Without Cities. Um, this was um, a study that voiced uh, a series of opinions about the nature of ancient Egypt. Um, and it was kind of a current th thought amongst archaeologists and 
researchers into ancient civilizations of that era that uh, we do have a number of uh, kind of ancient civilizations throughout the world that don't really go through a development of an urban phase, that uh, we're looking at uh, societies with um, sort of agricultural um, pr pro productive activities, but primarily uh, centers that were focused on kind of ceremonial activity that left us um, stone monuments and things. Um, but really kind of a, a much more rural kind of development. Um, so uh, John Wilson uh, left us this statement, ancient Egypt was a civilization without cities. Um, we can dis disregard that, I think. Um, this was really a failure, and uh, we do like to ridicule him somewhat nowadays. So. Uh, I think it was influenced to a large extent by um, the really kind of robust uh, uh, representational record in ancient Egypt. We do have these wonderful tomb scenes which uh, uh, present a sort of a bucolic view of Egyptian life. Uh, things like this uh, tomb scene you see here from the New Kingdom uh, showing a, a beautiful country estate and this high official, a man named Neb Nebamun, uh, kind of pre presiding uh, over the administration of his estate. Uh, things like this tomb model here from about 2000 BC. Uh, this belonged to a vizier of Egypt named Meket Re. Uh, it's a series of models actually of uh, his kind of country estate and you see a, a beautiful portico with a, a pond and a garden courtyard. Um, this thought was kind of influenced by these kinds of records. Um, and Wilson, amongst others, I think, didn't really appreciate um, the really kind of major physical evidence that we have that Egypt was, from its very beginnings, um, a highly urbanized society. Um, and in fact, uh, through uh, the, the millennia of Egyptian development, we can trace the kind of magnificent uh, evolution of uh, many uh, cities throughout Egypt, um, dotting the banks of the Nile. Um, since Wilson came up with this comment, um, a while ago now, obviously, um, 1961, um, urban archaeology has really come into its own in Egypt. So as I mentioned, this is really one of the most vibrant areas of research. Um, it's a challenging one in that um, the Nile environment, uh, the place where the Egyptians lived uh, along the banks of the Nile, is a constantly evolving and changing kind of floodplain. Um, it's a riverine floodplain, and many of the settlements that they lived in were right on the banks of the Nile or close to it. Um, and so uh, thousands of years of change, of course, have tended to obscure the physical remains of these uh, cities of ancient Egypt. So many of them are, in fact, kind of lost cities. Um, this doesn't deter archaeologists, of course. Um, we are interested um, in overcoming these kinds of physical hardships and learning what we can uh, about ancient Egypt. Um, and really, right after uh, Wilson came up with that sort of controversial statement, um, we have, uh, in the 1960s, the beginnings of really kind of a, a fluorescence of uh, urban research uh, in the Nile Valley. A great example of this um, is a site that some of you may, may be familiar with. Um, this is a site called Tel Adaba. Um, it's in the Nile Delta, um, quite close to the Mediterranean Sea, actually, on a branch in the, of the, the delta called the Pelusiac Branch. Um, if you translate the name, uh, it actually translates into English as the Mound of the She-Dog. Um, and of course, there's a more colorful English term that one could apply to this. I'll leave you all to figure out what that might be. Uh, but anyway, the Mound of the She-Dog, Atel Adaba, uh, was an ancient city called Avaris. Uh, which was the capital city uh, of a group of kings called the Hyksos, uh, the, the 15th dynasty in Egyptian chronology. Uh, they ruled in Egypt about 1700 to 1500 BC. And they, they, uh, they settled in and developed this kind of massive capital city, which was one of the largest cities in Egypt at the time. Um, it was right on the banks of this Pelusiac branch of the river. Um, and as you can see in the schematic diagram here, includes uh, a whole kind of range of different settlement areas, palace areas, um, all of it centered on a kind of a central harbor area where uh, these kings were engaged in uh, quite uh, extensive trade and uh, interconnections throughout the eastern Mediterranean. Um, since the 1960s, um, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, um, and particularly the archaeological, Austrian Archaeological Institute in Egypt, um, have been investigating this. And at this, this point in time, it's actually the largest, most extensive and informative urban project uh, on ancient Egypt. Uh, so we know a lot about this place. Um, it's a difficult site to work. Um, like many ancient settlements, um, it's in the floodplain. And uh, in order to excavate this place, uh, you have to use remote sensing uh, to find structures. Um, and in fact, uh, what the, the primary kind of modus operandi is to, uh, to rent uh, fields from local farmers. Um, they'll excavate it, retrieve what uh, evidence can come out of the ground, and then they just turn it back over to the local landowners. Um, so through this process, it's the 1960s, Tel Adab is one great example um, 
of a huge urban site, um, a really kind of major kind of entrepot on the, the, the northern, northeastern frontier of Egypt, the no northeastern Nile Delta, um, that tells us a lot about um, an early urban center in Egypt. Another great example, um, I think many of you would probably be more familiar with this, because it tends to be featured on TV from time to time, um, is uh, this more specialized example of an Egyptian town or city, uh, which is the, the settlement of the, of the pyramid builders um, that's been uh, excavated over the last 30 years or so by Mark Lehner um, and his organization called the Ancient Egypt Research Associates, uh, which is based up in Massachusetts. Uh, but you can see from that diagram there on the lower right-hand side, what they reveal is um, a really kind of a dense urban center um, that it's not properly a city in its own right, but it's kind of a suburb. It's an outlier to the main capital city of Memphis. Um, it's a, a special place that housed the pyramid builders of the fourth dynasty um, who were involved in building the great pyramids at Giza. Um, they found palace areas, again, extensive areas for storage of materials, um, administrative areas, and, and settlement or occupation habitation structures as well. So um, that's kind of a, a major contribution to kind of the early phases of Egypt. And an important part of it is actually, uh, and for all of uh, urban research in Egypt, is appreciating the relationship of these lost cities uh, to the Nile environment. Um, how do they adapt to the Nile floodplain? And you can see in that reconstruction, uh, they've been able to reconstruct some of the kind of water features, the harbors and canals and things that uh, created the landscape around the pyramids uh, back in the time of the fourth dynasty, about 2500 BC. Um, moving onwards, there on the, the map on the left, you can see um, the two sites I just mentioned. Um, the, uh, it's not, maybe the labeling's not very clear, but at the very top there is Tel Adaba that I mentioned, the capital of the Hyksos, uh, quite close to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Giza, of course, is uh, very close to Memphis, which we'll return to in just a little bit. Um, but there down in the south, you see in, in the larger lettering on uh, the, the western side of the Nile um, in Upper Egypt or Southern Egypt uh, is Abydos. This has been an important cent, uh, site for uh, the research of the Penn Museum uh, since the 1960s and my own work uh, started up in the 1990s. Uh, what I've been working on there, as you see in the, the schematic here, uh, is a, in fact, a royal mortuary complex, a place where we have uh, a king, a pharaoh's uh, tomb, uh, dating to about 1850 BC, along with a temple uh, in which the cult of that king was uh, celebrated and maintained, his mortuary cult. Uh, but near there, we've uh, discovered, in fact, a lost city. So I kind of have experience with this. And uh, so this is the area I'm talking about. This is the tomb of a pharaoh, uh, Senwazirat III of the 12th dynasty, who reigned about 1850 BC. His temple here, close to the edge of the Nile floodplain, and this blob on the map is uh, the ancient town, uh, which we discovered in the 1990s. Um, and here, just kind of zooming in on it, um, you see, the, again, the, the, the characteristics, the features of this mortuary complex. Um, we were very fortunate in the 1990s to, one of the, the great uh, exciting discoveries was actually to find the ancient name of this place. Um, and you see that kind of a shield-shaped uh, little um, uh, feature there in the middle. Uh, with hieroglyphs in it. Um, this is a line drawing of, in fact, a whole series of clay seal impressions, uh, which are tiny things, just about like an inch and a half big. Um, and you can see they crammed a huge number of hieroglyphs into this. This is the ancient place name for this mortuary complex. Um, and in Egyptian, as well as in English, it's quite a, t a tongue twister. Um, the, the place name here was Wahsut Chakaura Ma'acheru Em Abju. Um, and Surprisingly, that was the actual name that was conferred on this town that you see here. Um, this town was a place that housed the administrators, uh, the people, officials, priests, um, uh, all the personnel involved in maintaining the cult of this king, Senwazir III, in the nearby temple. Um, and in your mind's eye, just imagine if you were uh, one of the ancient uh, occupants of this town and you kind of journeyed away from from your house, uh, perhaps to another part of Egypt, and someone, you know, you met someone, and they asked, well, where are you from? Uh, and you had to reply, I'm from Wahsut Chaka Rama Acheru Em Abju. Um, you think the name of Philadelphia has enough syllables in it. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you didn't want to say that every time um, you met someone. So uh, these Egyptians were incredibly logical people. Um, 
and they abbreviated it. Um, so what you see there, um, uh, labeling the area of the town site that we've discovered, um, is the shortened version of Wasut Kaka Rama Acheru Mabju, uh, which is Wasut. Um, they just took the first two words of it, um, which means enduring are the places. Uh, the, the whole name means enduring are the places of Kaka Ra, which is one of the names of this king, and was the third true of voice in Abydos. Uh, so we've been excavating this town of uh, Waksut. Um, we started in the 1990s. Uh, we've taken some breaks from it because one of the uh, one of the drawbacks, I guess, not really a drawback, uh, but um, uh, one of the elements of settlement and urban research is the volume of material that uh, sites like this yield. And you often have to take pauses in the excavation program to analyze uh, the backlog of material. So uh, we have been working on it methodically, but uh, with uh, sort of breaks here and there to process the finds. Um, and here you see the ruins of it. Um, it's perched kind of on the edge of the low desert. You can see the Nile floodplain, the greenery behind, and modern houses that line the edge of the Nile cultivation. And you get a sense of the preservation of this site. Um, this is what we would consider a well-preserved settlement site. Um, you can't walk into these buildings anymore, but uh, when they're exposed, you get a sense of the ground plan. You can walk through doorways and uh, look at rooms. And in fact, there's a lot of uh, preserved uh, elements of the architecture. There on the right, you see, for example, uh, bricked uh, floors with a series of stone-lined doorways and column bases and things. Um, so comparatively speaking, it's a relatively well-preserved settlement. Um, uh, and it's a kind of a, a, good, a good example of uh, one type of urban development in ancient Egypt, um, which is what we would call the state-planned um, or government-initiated uh, urban site. Um, this isn't a site that developed uh, kind of spontaneously, but it was actually laid out by royal architects, designed specifically to house particular people um, who were responsible for maintaining the king's cult. So it looks a little bit like uh, sort of colonial Philadelphia with its very you know, regular rectilinear ground plan. It's that kind of an urban site. Uh, so, you know, planned by the central state. Uh, one of the very exciting discoveries um, is uh, the big structure that you see on the left side there uh, of the plan, this big uh, structure here. Um, this is a kind of a palatial residence. Um, uh, archaeologists aren't always very inventive when we um, name or label things. Uh, it's the biggest building in the town that we know of. Um, it was the first one that we actually started excavating so we called it Building A. Um, building A, what is it? Well, um, it's the mayoral residence. Um, it's kind of a palatial structure that housed um, a series of mayors um, who uh, ruled over this place over uh, several hundred years. And there you see a reconstruction of Building A um, in its original form. Uh, we actually think that Building A might, when the, the town was first established, it might have actually served um, as a temporary kind of residence for the king himself. Uh, one wonders at places like this, what happened when the pharaoh arrived? Um, he didn't just you know, pitch a tent. Um, there had to be some kind of accommodations for him. And in its original design, it has this kind of immense pillared uh, courtyard at the center that takes up like a third of the building. Uh, but that structure was actually very rapidly altered. Um, and the whole building began to evolve in a more kind of organic way. Um, so in its original design, it might have actually been briefly used by the king himself or other high officials, uh, but through most of its history, it housed this series of mayors um, who ran the establishment of uh, the, the cult of San Wazirat III. Um, I have a lot of fun with these uh, uh, computer-aided uh, design CAD reconstructions. Um, a lot of archaeologists do, um, so we can play around with these a lot. This is, uh, these are kind of bare bones reconstructions, obviously, uh, just based on the ground plan and the physical evidence that we have that survives. Um, this one's a little bit washed out looking, obviously. Uh, it's just kind of white, but we get, can begin to elaborate these things quite a bit. Um, we know that a lot of these buildings were, uh, were decorated with painted um, different colors of, of, of uh, 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 painted elements of the walls, sometimes wall scenes. In fact, we have uh, remnants of small pieces of wall uh, image, uh, like figural imagery that um, would have decorated this building. Um, you can see one of the elements of it uh, that characterizes it is the use of a, what we call a black dado. It's a sh kind of a shiny black lower part to the wall that would, would resist kind of damage and scuffing where most of the activity was going on. And many of the rooms had kind of a yellow upper part. Uh, so you can see there a bit of application of color to give you a bit of sense of it. 
Um, uh, what, what becomes a little harder is to really reconstruct it, really to give you a full sense of the, 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 the living spaces of these ancient settlements. Um, and at the point that I was doing this, um, a number of years ago, uh, my son actually was really into this uh, video game that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, Minecraft, um, it's this video game where you can build structures and cities and things. Um, and if you go online, you'll find some amazing Egyptian cities where people must have spent hundreds of hours in front of their computers uh, creating these uh, very inspired Egyptian cities. I tried to convince my son Alexander um, to do a reconstruction of the town of Waksut and the mayor's residence for me. Um, he said, Dad, I'm not going to do that. That's really boring. Um, so, uh, but anyway, other people have... Uh, uh, used, they've been more inspired, and uh, you can, of course, find these kinds of things. Um, uh, we, with our archaeological reconstructions, we tend to not go quite so overboard. Um, one of the things that we've discovered at, at South Abydos, of course, is evidence for these mayors. Um, the mayors of Waksut um, compose a sort of a dynasty. They descended from father to son uh, over about three centuries, um, from about 1850 uh, to about 1550 BC or thereabouts. Um, and there you see the names of some of them, uh, from seal impressions in clay and other inscribed objects. We can reconstruct this kind of local history of these mayors of the town of Wasut. Um, and we can follow this building that they occupied as it evolved over the centuries. And here you see just another one of these renderings. Now you see that big pillared um, central courtyard that I mentioned um, that was in the, the, the previous uh, images, that's now gone. Um, and in fact, there's a whole series of other more complex structures that are occupying the center of the building. So it was an evolving uh, kind of organic structure. And we see this in a lot of the other parts of the town as well. Uh, when you excavate ancient Egyptian towns and cities, uh, one of the fun things about it is you, you often discover the kinds of objects that, that we know that existed in the ancient texts uh, that are mentioned from time to time, uh, but things that, uh, in fact, are very rarely seen. And um, uh, one of the most exciting discoveries I've ever made uh, occurred in the town of Waksud in the mayor's house. Um, there you see a reconstruction of it. Um, it's an ancient Egyptian birth brick. Um, it's a quite large mud brick about yay big, that was painted with imagery of a, a mother in childbirth. Um, and there you see a scene of the mother having given birth. Um, there's a line drawing, and my wife did that uh, painted reconstruction there. Um, it's covered with kind of magical images associated with childbirth. And it, it allows us to, in fact, reconstruct a lot of the magical practices, the physical practices and religious uh, rituals that surrounded childbirth, which involved women squatting uh, on a set of four bricks that were stacked up. Um, and there's a reconstruction of it. Um, the, this is the kind, this is the practice of delivery of children in ancient Egypt um, and some of the implements that were involved with this. So it gave us a really kind of nice insight into uh, some of the, the social and cultural practices of the time. Um, as luck would have it, uh, the year we found the birth brick um, at Abydos, uh, uh, right after that my wife was actually pregnant um, it must have been the magical effects of the birth brick um, having some influence on her. Um, and I briefly uh, colluded with um, uh, the Penn Museum's uh, Director of Public Information, Pam Costi. Uh, we had the idea that um, it might be nice to ex uh, in invest in a little bit of kind of experimental archaeology. And we had the idea that I would make these birth bricks and decorate them, and then my wife could actually deliver um, our son Alexander on them and, and we would film the proceedings and make a documentary. Um, so you can imagine her reaction to this idea. Um, it's one of the greatest documentaries that was never produced. Um, so anyway, we, we had, a, had a lot of fun, of course, with the, uh, the birth brick event. Um, let's go on to the next. I think my little... My remote here has stopped operating, uh, so I guess I'll just switch to this. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, just to finish up our brief look into this, this town, this lost city of Waksut um, at Abydos, is um, after we found the name of it, we discovered uh, the, the, this ancient name, Waksut, uh, we actually um, found in a number of ancient sources, papyri and other documents, uh, mentions of this very town. Um, and here you see a papyrus uh, today in the Brooklyn Museum that mentions Waksut, um, and it gives us some interesting information. Um, connected with Waksut uh, were a bunch of guys who were working in the fields. Um, it mentions the fields and orchard lands of Waksut, 
And these weren't regular kind of locals. They were, in fact, captured fugitives um, who uh, were incarcerated and signed to physical labor in the fields. Um, so they're criminals. Um, we have evidence for crime in this town of South Abydos. Um, so you know the, the, the range of things we have here preserved in the, the evidence. We have mayors. Uh, we have criminals. We have all the makings, obviously, of a city, really, um, in you know, in familiar ways. And some of those mayors might have actually been criminals too. Who knows? Um, uh, so uh, Waksut uh, gives us a really nice kind of snapshot of Egypt um, in a particular time frame, um, the, the time frame of Egypt's late Middle Kingdom uh, through to the beginning of the New Kingdom. Um, Waksut brings up a very important uh, aspect of the study of cities and settlements in ancient Egypt, um, which is if you think back to the photos you saw of its location, um, it's not down in the floodplain, uh, but it's perched up on the edge of the desert. Um, and this is a reflection of one of the realities of uh, the ec ecological uh, setting of ancient Egypt. The environment in which uh, people lived and worked, of course, is a very active riverine environment. Um, the Nile River is uh, effectively a, a meandering river, uh, which is always kind of changing its course. It's breaking up and creating islands and eroding other uh, parts of land away. Um, it's kind of like a snake that slithers around in this kind of muddy uh, floodplain that it, it's flowing through. And so the Egyptians were always contending with that reality. Um, the land, of course, they called Kemet, uh, the black land, which is the alluvial plain uh, that they lived in and farmed. Um, uh, but for positioning settlements, uh, this was a critical issue for them uh, because uh, one of the features of the river, of course, was the uh, annual inundation of the Nile, um, which uh, you see here. This is a very uh, beautiful event that no longer occurs, uh, obviously, because uh, the Nile was dammed in the 1960s and the inundation no longer reaches Egypt. Uh, but here's some, some old views from postcards and a photograph there on the right-hand side. This is a, a fundamental reality for um, positioning Egyptian settlements, uh, towns and cities. They had to contend with this annual event where uh, the Nile flooded its banks um, and spread out across its floodplain all the way to the very edge of the desert. Um, this was a particular season. The Egyptians called Achet, the season of the inundation. Uh, and in our calendar, it occurred in kind of the late summer to, to beginning of the fall, usually end of June to September. Um, but you, as you can see in that photograph there on the lower right-hand side, um, uh, the, f the, the positions of settlements in the Nile Valley really have to contend with the comings of these waters. Um, and so uh, one of the things that the Egyptians did was pick areas of the terrain that were elevated um, above the reach of the waters. Um, this could be the edge of the desert, like the town of Wasut. It's right up on the desert uh, margin. It's beyond the reach of the flood. Um, but there were other places that the Egyptians gravitated towards. Um, and one good example of this is certain kind of high spots on the terrain um, that are kind of situated just high enough above the, uh, the waters of the flood. Um, these could be islands. Um, a great example of uh, a city that developed in this kind of environment um, is the city of Elephantine, uh, the modern town of Aswan, uh, which is Egypt's southern frontier city. Um, this city developed very, very early on. We have evidence of it even in the pre-dynastic period before the, uh, the advent, the beginnings of history and the time of the pharaohs. And you can see it occupies this beautiful picturesque island setting. Um, you can see it's elevated above the waters of the river. Um, so this kind of a thing, um, kind of a rocky outcropping, an island, uh, or in other places, uh, perhaps uh, similar kind of elevated areas were occupied. Um, as the Nile moves around, um, as this meandering river, one of the things that it did uh, was uh, it pushes up and creates these kind of gravelly uh, levees, river levees, um, the edges, the banks of the river that are uh, pushed up uh, you know, to a higher elevation. Um, and many of the ancient settlements uh, gravitated towards these ancient levees uh, that the river, the, ri the river left as it kind of evolved and moved around. Um, so the siting of towns and cities was really critical for the Egyptians um, because of the Nile inundation. Um, and here's just some views of Elephantine. It's a, re a really picturesque place. Um, as you can see, many of you probably visited Egypt, have probably been there at the first cataract. This was the frontier city of Egypt. Um, you can see how tightly situated to the, the, the rather confined island it occupies. Um, 
uh, how it really fits beautifully into that environment. Um, Elephantine um, is, uh, today it's known as Aswan. Um, in ancient times it was called Abu, uh, which means elephant. Uh, elephant Town. Um, we're not really sure why it was called Elephant Town, in fact. Um, Elephantine is, of course, the, the derivation of the ancient Egyptian word. Uh, there are two, ma two major theories. One is that this was the place where the caravans that went south uh, into sort of the Sudan and uh, kind of Central African regions uh, that brought back elephant ivory, which the Egyptians were quite interested in, the, those caravans left and returned to the site. Uh, so it may have to do with kind of the trade and acquisition of, of ivory, um, or it may have to do with the boulders. Um, you can see that flanking the island, rim rimming it are these beautiful granite boulders that look like the bodies of elephants. Um, so we're not actually quite sure why it was called Elephant Town, um, but these two, maybe these two things kind of converged in the, na the ancient name of Elephantine. Uh, but it's a great example of a very dense uh, city, of not a huge city, but a city of uh, relatively modest proportions um, uh, that evolves over thousands of years. And the German Archaeological Institute in Egypt has been excavating this site um, since the 1960s, a lot like Tel Adaba, and you can see some of the, uh, the ruins of it there. Um, a temple at the center uh, dedicated to one, one of the gods, uh, a goddess of uh, this town uh, called Satet, um, uh, the stone core of that, and then you can see the urban remains that kind of surround uh, the temple, uh, which is a typical uh, kind of a, a structure for an Egyptian town. And here's a reconstruction of it, uh, sort of an artist's view. Uh, on the, the Nile there, you can see moving away, um, one of the major products of this town, uh, one of the major activities apart from trading caravans, uh, was the local stone. Um, and some of you may have visited this wonderful uh, unfin unfinished obelisk uh, in the granite quarries of Aswan. Um, uh, the, the granite of Aswan was one of the major exports that was quarried here and uh, uh, moved northwards primarily to many other sites in Egypt for construction of great monuments. And there's this wonderful obelisk that was abandoned because of a crack in it. Um, this, the previous slide shows a obelisk that was successfully quarried. Uh, you can see it uh, on the, the boat there being moved northwards. Um, as you move north from As uh, Aswan or Elephantine into the northern parts of Egypt, um, you find that there are, uh, there are other interesting kind of settings that the Egyptians used for their towns and cities. Um, if you move all the way up into northern Egypt, into the delta, uh, one of the challenges there is there are no cliffs. Uh, there were um, uh, there, were, there were, however, uh, in ancient times, these kind of natural um, outcroppings or gravelly uh, kind of hills, which are one uh, result of kind of the geological formation of the Nile Delta. Uh, we call these turtlebacks, um, or in Arabic, they're called uh, geziras, uh, or jazira. It just means island. Um, it's the same word as the, uh, the TV network, Al Jazeera News. Um, these islands, so-called, are kind of raised or elevated areas in the floodplain of the, the Nile Delta. And it's here that we get some of the really big cities developing on these elevated areas. Uh, they created, um, over time, because it was kind of choice real estate, um, urban centers that kind of uh, developed upwards. They grew upwards, and this is the classic form of uh, what we call a tell um, in Near Eastern archaeology. Um, a tell is an urban mound, and the delta is full of these huge urban mounds. Um, this one looks a lot like the one we just saw. Uh, in Egypt, they're often called calms. It just means mound. Um, and they, uh, in, in almost every part of Egypt, there's calm such and such. It's an ancient city that survives as a kind of decayed mound uh, or urban, urban core. Um, and some of these were massive cities. Um, uh, this is a great example. Um, this is the ancient uh, town of, or city of Tanis, uh, which was one of the bigger ones in the Nile Delta. Um, in later times, you can get a sense of the massive scale of it and some of the surviving architecture. Uh, it has a picturesque name in Arabic. It was called, uh, it's called today San El Hagar, uh, which means the place that keeps rocks. Um, and the place that keeps rocks um, is called that because uh, there are these, all these architectural remains, um, temple remains and monuments uh, decorating the kind of central part of it where the ancient temples of Tanis were and magnificent things like this uh, great uh, Ramesside statue of Ramses, this Ramses II that was reused by later kings um, in decorating uh, one of the large temples at, at Tanis. Um, as if the environment of Egypt is not enough to contend with in terms of 
how the Egyptians adapted to it and the preservation over time of these uh, settlements. Uh, one of the unfortunate things that happened uh, relatively recently actually in Egypt, and, and by relatively recently I mean the, mostly the, the, the 19th and 20th centuries, early 20th centuries, uh, was the process of mining out of these ancient, the, the remains of these ancient towns uh, for fertilizer. Um, uh, as Egypt's population began to grow in the 1800s, they realized that uh, they could uh, mine out uh, from these towns something called sebach, um, which is fertilizer. It's a, uh, basically an organic rich material that um, they, uh, local farmers, uh, landowners, applied for permission to go to ancient sites and dig out the organic contents of rooms and buildings. Um, and a place that suffered extensively from this kind of, a good example of it, is uh, a site called Karanis, um, which is in uh, a, a, an area of Egypt called the Fayum, um, which you see it there. It's actually very close to um, ancient Philadelphia. They're on the kind of the northern part of the Fayum. You may see, there you let's see, yeah, the batteries are dead on this thing, but uh, hopefully you can see the lettering. There's Karanis and a little bit to the lower, a little bit off to the right is uh, the location of ancient Philadelphia. But anyway, this is a place that was mined extensively for the Sebach by these uh, guys called the Sebachin, um, who dug out the fertilizer and deposited it on the fields. Um, uh, but as this was going on, archeologists were increasingly worried about what was going on. Um, and uh, people began to get more active in urban research. And Karanis is a place that um, was extensively worked on uh, in the early 20th century by the Univ University of Michigan. Uh, they were actually attracted to the place initially by papyri. Um, there were reports of papyri coming out and they began to excavate. But as an offshoot, it became a good example of the early development in the beginning of the 20th century of kind of urban archeology. span um, So Karanis is a, is a great example of a nicely preserved site, but one that suffered through the depredations of these Sebachin and many, many settlements really um, were affected by this kind of thing. Um, the ancient Egyptians had many different terms for towns and cities of different scales. Um, here you see three of the most common terms we encounter in the ancient texts. Um, uh, they're sort of ranked by size. Um, Wehit um, was a kind of a, a small hamlet, uh, a little tiny village. Um, Demi um, is sort of in between. It's, it's applied uh, sort of generically to settlements of kind of modest scale. Um, and at the top of the, the ranking here is uh, the term Niut. Um, Niut literally means city. Um, Niut was actually applied to a whole range of cities of different scales. They could be really massive urban centers, like the capital city of Memphis, for instance. Uh, but other more modest kind of local cities also got this term. Um, smaller towns, towns and villages, like this one. Um, this is a very famous town, the, the town of the, uh, the, uh, the tomb builders of the pharaohs um, on western Thebes called Dar al Medina. Um, this was regularly just called the Demi, uh, which just means the town or the inhabited area. Uh, but when we're looking at cities in, in ancient Egypt, we're often talking about what we call the Niut, um, which is the kind of the highest order of towns and cities. And at the top of this is uh, one of the largest and most significant cities in ancient Egypt. Uh, many of you are familiar with it, uh, the city of Memphis, uh, which developed at the beginning of Egyptian history. Um, the foundation of Memphis corresponds with the beginning of, of the dynasties, the beginning of Egyptian history. Um, it was established in a very kind of logical, kind of geographical, kind of central setting. Uh, you see it there in red, um, right at the point where the delta of Lower Egypt or Northern Egypt meets the ribbon of Upper Egypt. Um, where those come together, this was a strategic point uh, where uh, the, the early pharaohs chose to establish their control. And Memphis has been a major focus of interest and research all the way back to the Napoleonic era. And here you see on the right um, a a image from the Description de l'Egypte, um, from the time of Napoleon, of the kind of environment of Memphis. People began to be interested in this place. Um, the archaeology of Memphis um, is a fascinating example of one of the great cities of ancient Egypt. Um, one that's very challenging, again, because of these issues of preservation that I mentioned. Uh, but um, increasingly, we can, we can appreciate the scale and the, you know, the significant scope of this urban center. Um, this is just an artist's reconstruction of kind of what it may have looked like in the floodplain. It was on the western side of the Nile, originally probably very close to the Nile. Um, now the Nile has actually shifted substantially to the east, away from where Memphis was, and Memphis is kind of 
kind of strangled in the, the local fields, as it were. Um, it's a city with a fascinating history. Um, we know a little bit, bit about its foundation. Um, the ancient records tell us that it was founded by the first pharaoh, a man called Menes in Egyptian records. And there's this intriguing little tale that's told by uh, Manetho, the ancient Egyptian historian. In his document called the Egyptiaca, he tells us that the king called Menes ruled for 60 years. He won renown, but he was carried off by a hippopotamus. Um, so he founded Memphis, but then later on, I don't know, a hippopotamus took him off into the Nile. Um, so a little kind of interesting, colorful tale about it. But Memphis is an incredibly important and long-lived center, um, urban center in Egypt, one of the most important cities through most of Egyptian history. There you just see the map of it. It has many names. When it was founded, it was called Ineb Hedge, which means the White Wall. Um, it later on became known as Men Nefer, uh, which was a derivation from one of the local pyramids that was called Men Nefer Pepi. Um, that pyramid, which you can just see on that plan there on the left-hand side, was very close to Memphis. And so the name of the pyramid began to be used more and more. Um, and that's actually the origin of our word Memphis in, in the, Greek, the Greek version of Men Nefer or Men Nefer Pepi. That's how it was frequently known. But in other names as well, um, it was often called the life of the two lands or Ankh Tawi, um, and uh, my favorite one here is uh, on the, the lower uh, image there, uh, is a very important name. Um, this is the name for the major temple that stood at the core of ancient Memphis. It was called Hut Kapta, uh, the temple of the spirit of Ta. Ta was the main god of Memphis. Um, and Hut Kapta was such an important temple that in fact it, it is the origin for the word Egypt itself. Um, derived through the Greek, Hut Kapta is the origin for the word Egyptos, which evolves then into our modern name for Egypt. So the name of the temple at the center of Memphis is why we call Egypt, Egypt today. Um, but Memphis has attracted uh, tons of interest and one of, the, one of the fascinating areas that people are interested in is in its early manifestation when it first develops at the beginning of the age of the pharaohs. Around 3000 BC, um, people have been searching for the city of the White Wall or Ineb Hedge uh, as it's known. We think a lot of the, the monuments, the pyramids that stand on the desert edge like the famous step pyramid of Djoser um, actually sh uh, s uh, use in stone uh, symbolic architecture that echoes the ancient appearance of Memphis. Um, and if you visit the Step Pyramid, as many of you probably have, um, surrounding it is this uh, kind of remarkable um, crenellated wall. Uh, we think that this is a kind of a simulation in stone of the original appearance of the walls of Memphis, the white walls that surrounded the residence or capital city. Um, just recently, a couple years ago, um, uh, very quietly working away at Memphis uh, for a long period of time uh, is this excavation of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, and they announced, it, announced two years ago that they actually have discovered physical remains of the original walls of Memphis, the white walls that uh, presumably look like this. Um, and they're still uh, uh, working down into the, the excavations to reveal uh, physical evidence of that. Uh, and of course, Memphis is a city. It's um, one that we are familiar with here in the Penn Museum because our museum has a long history of interest and active research at Memphis with our exposure and uh, work on the Palace of King Merenta, which is one of the great monuments of Memphis in the New Kingdom, uh, which is displayed currently in the Lower Egyptian Gallery. Uh, and if you wander around in there, you can, uh, you can find uh, actually on the columns and other parts of the building uh, the name for the ancient temple of Ta, the god of Memphis. Uh, there you see in the hieroglyphs it says Hut Kapta, uh, this temple that was so important at the center of ancient Memphis. Uh, Memphis is a great example um, of the sort of important continuities that um, in which these ancient cities um, evolved through long time frames, uh, trajectories of evolution that actually are echoed in modern times. Um, one of the important things about where Memphis was, where, where they chose to build Memphis at the beginning of Egyptian history 5,000 years ago has really kind of remained a kind of a logical control point um, as, the, as the location for the capital of, of Egypt. And through later antiquity into the Middle Ages and into the Islamic period, the capital of Egypt has always gravitated to this place where Memphis developed. So uh, in the Middle Ages, it, it moved slightly across the river uh, to a place called Fustat, um, and then just a little bit north of there, 
um, up to the, the, the area of uh, Cairo itself, which was founded in 969 by the Fatimid uh, uh, dynasty who moved into Egypt from Tunisia. And so um, it's evolved, but it's always remained in this kind of same place. And so these echoes of kind of uh, the importance, of the, the ideas that um, found and uh, govern the locations of cities and uh, how they work within their environment uh, evolve and connect modern developments with these ancient cities, and Memphis is really kind of the antecedent in many ways uh, to the modern city of Cairo. Um, Cairo itself, in fact, uh, in the Middle Ages was substantially built out of reused blocks taken from Memphis uh, and other nearby cities. Today, it's one of the largest cities on earth, and it's the sort of inheritor of ancient Memphis. Um, other great cities um, characterize Egypt, of course, and there are many, many, um, just one uh, that's incredibly important in the study of ancient Egypt, uh, worthy of mention, uh, is this uh, great capital city founded by Akhenaten, called Achet Aten, the horizon of the Aten, um, in the middle part of Egypt, in sort of a desolate desert bay, um, Akhenaten. Um, uh, over a period of about 20 years, uh, built this huge capital city, which was then abandoned. Um, and so it becomes a, a great sort of laboratory for the study of urban remains in Egypt, um, preserved on the landscape there. A lot of the houses uh, that flank the main kind of administrative and temple areas, which you see in that reconstruction there, uh, for the better part of 100 years. Um, uh, Achet Aten, or Tel Alamarna, as it's called, has been, has been one of the most important urban sites where we can study uh, ancient Egypt. Um, another of these great cities, of course, um, and many of you who visit Egypt have certainly been there, um, is the city of Thebes, modern Luxor in southern Egypt. This is sometimes called the southern capital. Um, and for the Egyptians, um, as I put in the label there, um, Thebes, Thebes court kind of embodies um, uh, many of the key ideas of the ideal or the model city. Um, the city of Thebes, in fact, spans both banks of the river. Um, as you can see, it has an eastern part and a western part. The eastern part was where the main temples of the gods were located. Um, the temple to the god Amun. Um, Amun was the main god of the city of Thebes, and he has a great stone-built temple complex there, um, and there's other kind of satellite temples. But the main city of Thebes grew up around these temples on the eastern bank. So this was kind of the living city. Um, but then as you cross over to the west, across the Nile, um, you entered another special part of Thebes, which was the city of the dead. Um, this was the, what we call the Theban necropolis. And this is where many of the temples to the, the pharaohs uh, were built, along with their tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Um, and so there's this kind of a beautiful kind of echo, the, the living world and the world of the dead um, in this kind of you know, integrated physical space. Um, so this is, is in, in many respects sort of the ideal kind of layout that the Egyptians would gravitate towards, um, is having a living city and a, on the, the other side of the Nile, um, the city of the dead. Um, here's some just some uh, reconstructions of parts of it. The Temple of Amun there, you get a sense of the walled precinct at perhaps the height of its development um, with the urban, urban areas around it. Um, here, this is a little bit of a sparse uh, kind of watercolor, but you, you get a sense of the, the living city, the city on the eastern bank, and then the Theban necropolis away uh, on the west. Um, the city of Thebes, modern Luxor, is one of the great archaeological treasures of Egypt and indeed the world because uh, so much of it actually survives physically. Um, and it has to do partially with its location in a fairly kind of uh, traditionally kind of remote rural area of Upper Egypt uh, that hasn't seen a lot of development. Um, other major cities haven't had that luxury. Um, and one of the great examples of a lost city of Egypt um, is uh, the incredibly important city of Heliopolis. Um, Heliopolis was never a capital city, uh, but it probably housed the biggest temples that were ever built in Egypt, including the great temple to the sun god, Re. Um, today, um, you can see that Heliopolis is a little bit of a compromised uh, environment. Um, contrast the painting there uh, from about 1800 of the somewhat nice, attractive uh, rural setting of Heliopolis uh, a couple hundred years ago with the pyramids away in the distance uh, with what it looks like today. Um, it's in totally encased, encumbered with uh, the urban development of modern Cairo. 
Um, and so uh, archaeologists that have been digging there have uh, really had to contend with a lot of kind of uh, issues of preservation and access, um, but nevertheless, they're striving to reconstruct this major city. Um, if you visit Heliopolis today, almost all you see is one single standing obelisk that once was just one of um, um, probably dozens and dozens of obelisks that uh, decorated the temple precinct of this huge urban center of Heliopolis. Um, almost all of it gone and buried, um, but there you see some of these excavations that have been intent on revealing the nature of Heliopolis. Um, and uh, Heliopolis did make it into the news relatively recently. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, discovery. Uh, a couple months ago, um, they came upon a, a beautiful kind of fragmentary but colossal figure initially identified as Ramses II, or Ramses the Great, uh, that actually turned out to be a different pharaoh, Semeticus I, uh, from uh, the late period of Egypt, um, Dynasty 26. Um, there was a lot of fanfare, of course, when they discovered this, um, and you can see the exuberant crowd there as the statue uh, was being pulled from the ground. Um, but this is just one kind of tidbit from this major lost city of ancient Egypt, Heliopolis, which archaeologists are striving to, to reconstruct. Um, along with the urban remains, the physical remains, the archaeological evidence, um, one of, the one of the very important sources of information on cities in ancient Egypt is the documentary evidence, uh, papyri and monuments with texts and inscriptions that record um, evidence or information relevant to reconstructing these lost cities. Um, among these, one of the most important early records um, comes in the form of this relatively small, modest looking building, which sits today um, in Thebes, very close to the temple of Karnak in Upper Egypt. Um, it was a kind of a, a festival building uh, connected with the, what we call the Sed Festival of a king called Senwazret I around 2000 BC at the beginning of the 12th dynasty. Uh, but when they decorated this building, interestingly, they, uh, they created a map, um, an ins inscribed map all around the base of this building. And if you walk around this white chapel of Senwazret I, uh, what you'll encounter is all around it, uh, uh, decorating the, the whole kind of uh, perimeter of the building, is a record of the different towns and cities of Egypt, uh, their division into what we call the gnomes, or the provinces. Um, and there you see, just in that example, uh, just a, a group of three of these um, gnomes or provinces with the name of the gnome, and then what's called the gnome capital, the regional capital, kind of like the state capital, uh, like Harrisburg. Um, it, it lists the name of that city. Um, interestingly, they even give us numbers. They give us the, the dimensions of these gnomes along the Nile. And so you can take these inscriptions and you can create a, a, an actually a, a, a two-dimensional map um, of Egypt as it existed uh, 4,000 years ago based on these inscriptions. And here you see it reconstructed, a little kind of confusing drawing there, but the, the gnomes and the gnome capitals of Upper Egypt and uh, Northern Egypt, the Delta, uh, traditionally, there were uh, 42 gnomes of Egypt, uh, like the states of the United States, uh, 42 gnomes, uh, usually 20, 22 of the south and 20 or thereabouts uh, up in northern Egypt. Uh, but this kind of evidence um, is something that uh, pairs very nicely with the archaeological evidence. Um, and many, uh, many people are, of course, uh, searching for uh, physical remains that we can tie into uh, this inscriptional evidence. Um, amongst these cities that are listed and uh, recorded in these, these inscriptions, like the White Chapel, are many, many important places that have never been discovered, have never been found, have never been glimpsed through excavation. Um, and just two worthy of mention uh, here, um, two that I would love to find. Um, on the left there is a place called Ichtawi. We know a lot about it from the ancient texts. It was the royal capital of Egypt uh, for several centuries. Um, it was built by a king called Amenemhat I around 2000 BC. And we even know roughly where it was because the king built his pyramid near the capital and his pyramid still survives at a place called Lisht. Um, this city of Ichtawi should be somewhere near there, but archeologists have never managed to find it. Um, it may simply be submerged or buried in the floodplain. Um, so the search for Ichtawi um, is something that interests me and there's some archeologists working on that, uh, attempting to find it currently. Um, another city that I would 
really like to find is the one on the right-hand side there. Um, this is one of the gnome capitals, uh, these regional capitals. It, it's called Thynus uh, in the ancient texts. Uh, Thynus was actually the place where the first pharaohs came from. The kings who founded Egypt at the beginning of the first dynasty, who unified it, uh, they came from this place. Later on, it was the gnome capital uh, that in which the, the, the important cult center of Abydos, where I've been working, was located. Uh, so it should be somewhere near Abydos, but we're not quite sure where it is. Um, and at brief other moments in time, it may have actually br br had a brief resurgence as a kind of a dynastic capital. Um, and one of the discoveries that Steve mentioned just in the introduction is the, the recent discovery of the tomb of a lost pharaoh, Seneb Kai. Um, his tomb is one of a group of eight tombs, in fact. Uh, there's seven others that belong to kings of this same era. And we think that these guys probably ruled from this city called Thynus. Um, we call them the Abydos dynasty, but Thynus was very likely their dynastic capital um, around, say, 1650 to 1500 BC or so. Um, so I'd love to find Thynus and find the, the palace of of King Senebkai, then we'd have his, his palace and his tomb. That would be quite a coup, right? But um, unfortunately, it's probably buried somewhere deep beneath the muck of the river. Um, just to wrap up the, the talk uh, this evening, um, uh, no discussion of Egyptian the, the, the cities, the lost cities of Egypt would be complete with, without a uh, mention, of course, of uh, one of the queen cities of the Mediterranean, uh, ancient Alexandria. Um, of course, Alexandria dates uh, very late in the history of Egypt um, from the Greco-Roman period. It was founded, of course, by Alexander the Great and primarily developed by the Ptolemaic uh, dynasty, uh, the successors of Alexander in Egypt. Um, so it's kind of prime period of development is uh, roughly 332 BC to about 30 BC when Cleopatra the Great uh, died and Egypt was invaded uh, by the Roman Empire uh, as Augustus Caesar uh, took over Egypt as a, um, a province of the Roman Empire. But um, Alexandria is a great example um, of the importance of studying ancient cities um, in the, the ways that they link with kind of modern urban experiences. Um, Alexandria, um, at the time the Ptolemies ruled Egypt, was uh, primarily thought of as a special city that was kind of apart from Egypt itself. Uh, it, it has many of, the, tra of the, the key trappings, really, of a Greek met metropolis, many of the institutions of a Greek city. Uh, but it's much more complex than that. It was a really kind of a true multicultural city of the type that's familiar in our modern experiences. Um, there are very few cities of the ancient world that represent the scope of kind of a, an urban center of this type, the, the scope of kind of multicultural development. Um, it had different quarters occupied by different uh, ethnic and religious groups. Um, and of course, the study of Alexandria is one of the, the, the very important areas of archeological work in Egypt. Um, it uh, illustrates uh, uh, something that's true of many of these ancient cities, which is that uh, one is contending, uh, like in Heliopolis as well, contending with uh, the modern development uh, that kind of superimposes itself over ancient remains. Uh, so much of ancient Alexandria is beneath uh, this major modern city of about five million people. Nevertheless, archeological work is uh, revealing many important aspects of it. A prime focus has been this um, harbor area, of course. Uh, this was where the palace quarter, the royal quarter of Alexandria was, and of course the famous uh, lighthouse at the, uh, the western side of the, the coastline of Alexandria is of, is of interest. Um, here's just a, a illustration from uh, National Geographic recently showing kind of a reconstruction of this with the, the Pharos Island with the, uh, the famous lighthouse kind of on a, a smaller island uh, off to the east and the, the royal city. Uh, but Alexandria is a great place uh, to kind of um, illustrate kind of the uh, the, the fascinating um, kind of turns of events that can occur in archaeological excavation. Uh, some of you are probably familiar, uh, of course, with this amazing work that's been done in recent years um, in the harbor area, in the Mediterranean itself. Um, uh, work, especially by the French, uh, has revealed um, amazing monuments, uh, royal statues and sphinxes that are submerged. And as you can see in this diagram, uh, much of what was once the ancient coastline is now submerged beneath the Mediterranean. Uh, these very striking images of pharaohs beneath the sea and sphinxes with scuba divers uh, in front of them. Uh, this is a testament to the, the 
interest and uh, kind of dynamic uh, work that's being done on Alexandria. Um, and um, uh, one of the one of the other interesting just kind of links uh, in terms of uh, urban history that tie ancient Alexandria with the modern city um, is the famous L uh, Library of Alexandria, which of course was burned when the Romans uh, took it uh, in 30 BC, uh, which doesn't exist physically, but uh, survives as a kind of a symbol. Um, and the Egyptians in recent times have actually uh, kind of symbolically rebuilt the ancient library um, in the form of this thing, which looks a bit like a UFO that's landed on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's not that, but it's this new library which is meant to evoke um, the symbol of the great past of this multicultural city with its centers of learning and the great library recreated now um, in modern form. So a modern city kind of tapping into symbols of the past um, and the lessons of history. Um, and my final slide, um, just to finish with this, um, to kind of push this point to just the final con conclusion is um, Egypt today, of course, um, many of you are aware, is, is one of the most densely setter, settled countries in the world because the fact of the fact that human life does depend so dramatically in this arid environment on the life-giving waters of the Nile um, and the, bl the banks of the Nile. You can appreciate this. Um, from space where you see Egypt lit up at night, um, the cities along the banks of the Nile really kind of lighting it up, um, contrasting with the, the desert regions around it. Uh, but that urban development is one that has evolved over thousands of years and really kind of understanding our modern experiences is definitely rooted in archeological archeolo work and appreciating uh, these lost cities and how they uh, set a, a precedent for modern urban experiences. All right, so uh, that's the end of my lecture. I'd be happy to take any questions as uh, Steve mentioned. Um, so <clears throat> I think there's a microphone that may be passed around. Someone, I'll give him a mic. How about that, Joe? Sure. Uh, there was someone over there, I think. Yeah, in your uh, discussion, the, the kind of the three sizes, the village, town, city, okay. yeah. scale, in terms of population, what would they what would that represent, just to give us a sense of scale? And also the Waksu town, the, the reconstruction that you were showing us, what would a population of a town like that have been? Yeah, um, you asked great questions. They're, they're ones that are hard to answer. Um, the, um, I mean, the sort of gradation of terminology, the, the village, town, and city, um, it's a little bit more complicated, and the, the, the use of those terms doesn't quite equate all that neatly with those kind of concepts. Um, so, I mean, for example, the word niut, which we translate as usually as town or city, I mean, there's quite a, a range in population and scale that seems to be represented by that particular term. Um, the, the term in the middle that I, I introduced, demi, um, it literally just means settlement or occupied place. Um, and we find it in the text both referring to kind of regions of population as well as specific towns. Um, so they, sometimes they vary in the way they apply the terminology. Um, in terms of estimating population, this is one of the, the real challenging issues. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, to estimate ancient population levels. Um, in the case of Waksut, um, uh, we can sort of extrapolate outwards from uh, we have a lot of evidence for kind of the elite levels, uh, people that are recorded in monuments and on seal impressions. Um, uh, this is, I mean, sort of the, the kind of the higher echelons of that town, uh, probably numbered at any point in, you know, in the hundreds, you know, something like 100 to 200 kind of high level administrators and officials connected with the temple of the king. Um, you know, so extrapolating out from that to sort of, you know, a larger population of families and um, you know, local farmers who were supporting that town. Um, you know, it could have been something like one to 2,000 people, probably, um, but, but very hard to really calculate with any accuracy. Yes. What do you say about uh, the gnomes and uh, cartography? And, you know, if they put on them papyrus, and uh, what era did it start? Uh, when did they begin recording the, sort of the geography? Uh, um, 
It goes way, way back. I mean, we, we begin to get the names of towns and cities um, alre actually already before the, unif the final unification of Egypt in the pre-dynastic. Um, uh, they have these monuments called the, the, the palettes, slate palettes. And one of these has a, a basically a, a list of cities. Uh, it has little enclosures with like a city wall and the name of the city inside of it. Um, so it's a tradition that goes way, way back. Um, uh, a lot of it had to do um, either with administrative activities. Um, so in papyri, you get compilations or listings, um, often kind of uh, organized into groupings, uh, say by gnome or some other categorization. Um, for administrative purposes, um, or um, it has to do with uh, kind of religious activities, symbolic activities. So uh, the white chapel that I showed of St. Wazirat that has this kind of inscription around it, um, that, that symbolizes the realm of the king. I mean, the, the king is shown as, um, is worshipped inside this building, venerated in terms of his political and territorial power that encompasses this whole country, which is then laid out in detail in the inscriptions around. Um, so, so there it's more of a symbolic statement, but, it, but it's done in tr tremendous detail um, in order to emphasize the, you know, the, the role of the king and his authority as the supreme um, kind of leader in government. Yes. I bet there's probably not one answer, but uh, <laughs> do you know what caused these cities to be abandoned or were they destroyed? Yeah, um, th that again is, it's, a, it's an answer that would depend a lot on the individual towns or cities you're talking about. Um, in a lot of cases, we do know that um, cities that were occupied over long time frames, um, eventually um, something does change in the local landscape that makes that particular location less viable. Um, so a good example, um, I, I showed one of these great town mounds called, uh, called Tanis in northern Egypt. Um, that city actually developed because not far away was a capital city founded by Ramses the Great called Pyramese, the House of Ramses, which was the capital of Egypt in the late New Kingdom. Um, but um, the Nile actually moved away from that city. And so they, they abandoned it and they relocated it to this site called Tanis, uh, which then grew up into this massive uh, urban center. Um, so that, you know, Environmental changes, the shifting of the water courses and things, this could certainly influence places. Um, uh, other places just kind of, um, I mean, a, a good example of um, a place that just kind of lost its reason for existence would be the, the, uh, the, the small settlement called Daryl Medina that I showed, which was the town of the tomb builders of the pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings. Um, at the end of the New Kingdom, they stopped building the, the great decorated tombs and the money dried up. The government stopped paying the, the wages of the people and they just weren't needed anymore. So Daryl Medina sort of dissolved uh, its reason for being, just ended. So there's all kinds of interesting stories in these towns and cities as to why they were abandoned. Um, yeah, so it's sort of a case-by-case -case issue. Yes. I showed, yeah, the Fayum region. Can you talk a little bit about the Fayum portraits? I have seen a couple of sure. exhibits all over. How, what, what was the significance? Yeah, so the, um, uh, the Fayum is a region of Egypt which where uh, there's a branch of the river on the western side. Uh, it's called the Bahar Yusuf. It breaks off and then it flows out into a, a depression in the kind of western desert where there's a lake um, uh, called Lake Moeris in ancient times or Lake Fayum today. And it's a really rich kind of oasis-like region that's tied to the, the main valley of the Nile. Um, and it was really important in certain periods of Egypt, especially in the Greco-Roman period. Um, the site of Karanis that I showed um, in the northern part of the Fayum, it's one, one example of many, many cities that were developed in the, the Greco-Roman period. Um, the Fayum portraits date to this same time frame. So uh, they, they primarily come from uh, the, the early Roman period, um, uh, very, maybe very end of the Ptolemaic period, but primarily the early Roman period. Um, and they're connected with kind of the final stages in the development of mummification in Egypt. Um, they were used uh, to, um, as uh, basically kind of a face mask um, placed over the, the face of the dead um, to preserve kind of the physical appearance. Um, so preservation of the body was very important in mummification, and this is one 
one practice that emerges in the Greco-Roman period, uh, particularly in the Fayum. Mm. Yeah, I'd be, I'd, um, I, I don't know enough on, on those connections to really comment on that. Um, yeah, it's a period of time that's quite a bit later than what I work on. Um, yeah, I'm sure various theories have been suggested about possible similarities in early Christian icons and, and the fine portraits, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> so, a couple other questions. There's one in the back and one in the middle and one down here, I think. I'm just curious practically about how you know where to start digging. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I mean, is it from something like the White Chapel or are there just all these, I mean, and then also, you know, you talked about taking, you know, renting someone's field and ripping <laughs> it up and then re, yeah. I mean, how does all that work practically? Yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing process of um, detective work, I guess, is one important part of it. Um, I mean, archaeology is a little bit like a detective case where you're looking for evidence and trying to figure out how to, how to find it. Um, so yeah, if, I mean, from my experience with, I mean, for example, finding the town of Waksut, um, we, we did a ground survey and we, we found, I mean, visible on the surface were mud brick walls, indications that there were structures buried under the ground there. A lot of pottery, which was obviously what we call settlement debris. So we knew there was a settlement on the site. Um, it, we were lucky in that case that it was actually right below the surface. And once we started excavating, you know, just, I mean, half a foot down, we hit the tops of walls. Um, so it's a relatively shallow kind of site. Um, other sites are much more, much more deeply buried and often encumbered by layers and layers of later occupation. Uh, so that's often a challenging thing. Um, Urban archaeology in, in Egypt and throughout the world is really benefiting from scientific techniques uh, nowadays, uh, so various kinds of remote sensing. Um, so a lot of things we found at Abydos, we've, we've initially identified using uh, magnetometry, which is essentially magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging under the ground and uh, can pick up things like mud brick structures. Um, so you get sort of a signature of a, maybe a rectang you know, rectilinear building. You're not sure quite how far down it is, but... Uh, that's often a good clue. Um, yeah, so there, I mean, there's all, all kinds of techniques that people use. Um, re remote sensing is more and more kind of a crucial first step in finding sites and gaining a sense of where to dig. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> in your work, uh, when you excavate, have you ever found any forms of writing or hieroglyphics? And you mentioned you just mentioned pottery on the surface, but have you found any other artifacts? Yeah, um, we find writing all the time. Um, and this, uh, the town of Waksud, for instance, I mean, it was a, a major administrative center. So um, one of the things we get tons and tons of, in fact, we have um, about 25,000 of them at this point, are clay seal impressions. Um, so in ancient time, in, in this particular period, they uh, would, uh, they would often seal objects like uh, containers, like boxes or, or doorways uh, with wads of clay and they would stamp it with a scarab that has the names and titles of a person, like an, an official who's taking responsibility for the closure of that object or that room or whatever it is. Um, and so when they open it again, you get these broken clay seal impressions. Um, and so that's how we actually, we know the names of a lot of the people, like the mayors that I mentioned. It's from these clay seal impressions. Uh, but we get other objects, commemorative objects, statues and stele, um, usually in tiny fragments, um, which is often very frustrating because you often have you know, the beginnings of a name and the rest of it's missing. So, um, it's a little bit of a, it's like a jigsaw puzzle with most of the parts missing. <laughs> and you're trying to piece it all together. Yeah. Dr. Wagner, there, there may not be an answer to this, but when you have the beginnings of urban centers, especially large urban centers, like you talked about in Egypt, obviously the people that live there can't, uh, they, they can't raise crops and they can't raise livestock. 
Are there any thoughts in, in archaeology or in Egyptian archaeology about how many people it takes in terms of the, the agriculturalists, the people living outside the city, to support one urban dweller? Yeah, I, I, I can't off the top of my head quote any studies, but you know, people have certainly looked at those kinds of issues. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously, those are complex kinds of calculations to come up with. Um, you know, a lot of these cities were, I mean, they were both ceremonial centers as well as administrative centers, as well as the nucleus for kind of a wider agricultural region. I mean, so, I mean, really the development of urban is, urbanism in Egypt is part and parcel of the development of, of agriculture. I mean, when we get sedentism and people beginning to, uh, you know, undertake farming practices, uh, they settle down nearby and they, they begin to develop set, you know, settlements which evolve into towns and cities over time. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's integrally connected with the, the surrounding kind of agricultural matrix. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, we think that, I mean, for every one of like the top administrators, there's dozens or probably hundreds of agriculturalists who are, who are represented. Um, and if, I mean, it probably depends a lot on the period you're talking about. Yeah, it's true, and I mean, one of the, one of the realities is we, we tend to have just little snapshots here and there of parts of what are obviously large settlements, um, but really, I mean, reconstructing the total you know, spatial scope of a, a town at any given point in time, is, it's often beyond the, the capabilities of our excavation or remote sensing. Um, but in, in, in general, the feeling, I think, currently is that, I mean, urban centers were probably much more significant in scale already very early on in Egypt than people have given credence to and you know, going back to people like Wilson. <laughs> These were not just, you know, empty ceremonial centers with a, a few people that, you know, priests and, you know, and, you know, a, a surrounding rural population, but in every case, you know, these ceremonial centers, the temples, the, you know, Structures dedicated to the worship of the gods is the nucleus for a, an administrative center with a, a big kind of surrounding urban development. But yeah, estimating population is tremendously difficult. Um, yeah, people have tried to come up with figures like um, just going on area, estimating the the average number of people, you know, per per square meter, kind of. But I mean, they're probably just very wildly inaccurate figures. I would think guesstimates, I guess, is the, the way to think of them. Other questions up here? Yeah, this is kind of a general question, but I'm curious. How difficult or easy is it for the science of archaeology, without corroborating historical evidence, to identify these ancient Egyptian urban centers as predominantly administrative, religious centers, or even like commercial centers? Well, archaeology is really the, the primary source, um, and we get physical remains of all those activities. So, I mean, um, just going back to my experience in Waksut, um, we have a temple, which was the primary kind of focus for the higher echelons of the population with priests and the administrators kind of running that. Um, we also have evidence for industrial activity. So we have, we have bakeries and breweries. I didn't talk about that, but physical remains of a large kind of productive facility where they're brewing beer and bake, baking bread on large scale. And um, there's, other, I mean, there's other productive activities. We have uh, indications of uh, metal working and carpentry work. Um, yeah, so those kinds of industrial things emerge from the physical evidence. Um, and, then, and then in terms of administration, we actually have parts of the, these buildings where we can see that scribes were at work and we have the seal impressions, you know, recording the openings of papyri, you know, as they opened document boxes and put records in and sealed them. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papyrus sealings all dropped in one place. Um, behind the mayor's house, for instance, there's a structure called the Ararit, um, which was translates roughly as the administrative gatehouse, and that's where the scribes primarily worked, I guess, on a daily basis. Um, 
So yeah, um, I mean, archaeological remains really allow us to you know, study and kind of create a lot of texture in our understanding of towns and cities. So, again, it's um, in the, the major, ma the two major kind of caveats, of course, are the, the preservation of these sites is often partial or spotty. Um, none of these sites are, you know, really like, you know, Pompeii, for instance, you know, sealed beneath lava and um, accessible kind of at the moment of death. Um, they're, they're, they're settlements that have suffered in many cases extensively. Um, and then really just the, the scale at which archaeological work can be practiced uh, is another limiting factor. Um, it's often pointed out that it, it often takes archaeologists longer to excavate, analyze, and publish an ancient building than it did the ancient people to produce it in the first place. So, yeah, so it's a, it's a slow, painstaking process. <laughs> Thank you.